So good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to today's event. Um, as you know, it's barely four weeks since Silicon Valley Bank abruptly collapsed. It's not even four weeks, actually, today. And two weeks ago, even while events were still unfolding and Signature Bank and First Republic Bank had come under threat, Stern held a panel discussion on what we were seeing in the data in real time. This, and since then, of course, we've had the Credit Suisse event and, and continued stresses in the banking sector, although for the nonce, things look like they've calmed down a little bit. Um, so the finance department, after the panel, the finance department stern put together a white paper group, and this panel discussion today is going to discuss their preliminary findings that will be reported shortly. As some of you may know, during the financial crisis uh, 15 years ago, the department put together a group very rapidly and came out with several books on the on the topic, most of which, uh, copies of which are here. If any, anybody would like a history lesson, the copies of the books they produced and the lessons they produced from that period are here. So, but with that, uh, let me turn it over to Jillian Tett, one of the world's leading financial journalists. We're very lucky to have her here to moderate the discussion. Over to you, Jillian. Well, thank you very much indeed, Raghu. And I must say, I feel, Raju, I feel a bit like I'm trapped in Groundhog Day because... It was really in a couple of years after the financial crisis that I first started coming to NYU in Stern and took part in a number of seminars back then about what had happened in the great financial crisis, the GFC, um, as they called it. And of course, back then, there were lots of pledges that this would never happen again, that regulators would reform the system to make sure it was going to be rock solid going forward and that all of those um, bankers and financiers and investors had learnt the right lesson and were going to be much more risk-averse going forward. Well, fast forward to today, and it clearly didn't work because, of course, we've just had this dramatic um, explosion of panic last month, the so-called March Madness. Now, on the way here, I was actually on the phone to the CEO of one of the biggest banks in America, who was trying very, very hard to tell me um, that all of what happened in March was down to, quotes idiosyncratic issues. That's a new buzzword or mantra from all the big banks who have survived and the ones who actually, in some cases, are actually thriving, but it's all down to idiosyncratic stuff. Um, Jane Fraser from City said that again last week in Washington. And it's a way of saying it ain't us Ain't us, Gov. Those people at Silicon Valley Bank massively mismanaged everything. They were stupid. Um, and it should be said, there's a certain amount of Wall Street and financial tribal prejudice going on on both sides, which is that most bankers who have grown up in Wall Street think that those techies are kind of weird Martian aliens who all look like Mark Zuckerberg and kind of had it coming to them. And most techies think that Wall Street bankers are as boring as anything they can imagine and very fuddy-duddy, and they'd far rather think about computer science than boring things like cash management, which, of course, is one reason why we're here today. So lots and lots of arguments, and it's all down to, quote, idiosyncratic factors, a few bad apples, and the system is basically fine. So we have an amazing panel to tell us whether this is right or not. Um, known to all of you, the NYU um, All Singing, All Dancing Financial Disaster Team, Philip Schnabel at the end, we have Larry, Wh sorry, Larry White and Varela Charia who are going to present their research and we're going to start with Philip. Well, Philippe. So over to you, Philippe, to tell us whether it is indeed just all an idiosyncratic issue or not. Perfect. Um, my You're looking for this, yes. this guy. Perfect. So um, it truly really does feel like Groundhog Day. Uh, I remember coming here to Stern 15 years ago, right when uh, the last financial crisis started. Uh, I just graduated, uh, armed with a PhD, and it was a very exciting time to be here to learn about banks, and I think we have learned a lot uh, since then. And what I want to share today is to talk a bit about what banks usually do when they think about interest rate and interest rate risk management. So I'm not going to talk about SVB. Um, it may or may not be idiosyncratic, but what I want to think about is what the other banks should do, and I will give some clues on whether they got it right in terms of managing the risk in the face of changing interest rates. So let me start by describing what's the problem. 
So the problem is the following. So since you know, 2021, early 2022, in order to combat inflation, the Federal Reserve has raised short-term rates, think of the Fed funds rate, by 4.5%. Now, when you raise short-term rates, you hope that long-term rates are going to go up because they reflect the expected future short rates. And so they did. They went up by around 2.5%. Now, what's the problem for banks? Well, banks hold long-term loans and securities, uh, roughly 17 trillion, with an average duration of uh, four years. Now, it's actually straightforward to calculate what's the market value loss if interest rates go up, given this duration, given this size. All you have to do is you multiply the change in the long-term interest rate, the 2.5%, with the duration, which is four, and the size of the balance sheet, which is 17 trillion. So that means the fair market value of the long-term assets actually declined by 1.7 trillion. Now, two things about this number. First of all, it's not hidden. Um, you know, we know what's the duration of bank assets. It's not complicated. It just took me one line to uh, calculate this. Now, um, Second point about this number, it's large. It's actually larger than a lot of the numbers floating around. The reason for that is the numbers which are floating around only look at securities. But loans are also long-term assets. Just because they're not traded doesn't mean they didn't lose the market value because of raising interest rates. And so this number is very large, and it's roughly the size of bank equity, which is $2.2 trillion. So if you hear these numbers, you're going to be very worried. You would say, well, that means banks are basically bankrupt, and so you know, the equity value should have gone down to zero. If you actually look what happened to bank stocks, and here I'm plotting a bank stock index, what you see is that bank stocks actually have held up pretty well as the Fed was raising interest rates. Um, and you know, yes, we had a crisis. We had turmoil in March, and then down 25%, but nothing close to what my calculation suggests. So clearly, there's something else going on with these banks, such that they're actually holding up reasonably well, even though they face such a big problem with the asset side. So what's the reason? Well, it's the deposit franchise. What's the deposit franchise? Well, what makes banks special is they lend long and they borrow short. It's important to understand how they borrow short. They borrow short by issuing deposits. Now, People, households, businesses, they like deposits because they're convenient, they're safe, and they need them to transact. And so um, you know, deposits are willing to accept very low deposit rates. So banks know that when rates go up, deposits become much more profitable for banks. The way banks measure that is with what they call deposit beta, which is only 0.2. What's the deposit beta? Well, it tells you deposit rates only go up by 0.2% for every 1% increase in the Fed funds rate. So what that means is they're going to keep 0.8 or 80% of the increase for themselves. That's what makes them profitable. So it's easy to see in this picture. Here in this picture, I'm going to plot the deposit rates for the main categories of deposits. This is checking, savings, and CDs or time deposits. What do you see? Interest checking basically pays nothing, even though the Fed funds rate has been going up. Savings, which is the main category of deposits, now pays something like 40 basis points, or so 0.4 percentage points, still very low. And CDs pays a bit more. It's still small. It's growing, but something on the order of 1.4, 1.5 percentage points. What that means is the difference between these colored lines and the black line, that's the profit for the bank in terms of a deposit spread. Now. That means the deposit franchise is actually the hedge against rising interest rates on the asset side. So you can easily put a number on that. Banks roughly have 17.5 trillion in deposits. The average deposit rate now, if you kind of weigh it by the right size, it's 0.9 percentage points. So what's the spread? Well, it's the 4.5 percentage points, which is the Fed funds rate, minus the 0.9. So that's the 3.6% deposit spread, which banks, on average, the system of all is making right now. Now, is that large or is that small? Well, multiply 3.6% with the size of the deposits. And basically, the increase in income from deposits is $630 billion per year. So that's what makes them profitable. So if you think about the problem I described, three years of that deposit income is enough to make up for these asset losses. So deposits went from being extremely unprofitable to extremely profitable. 
Now, if you use historical deposit betas, and I've done the calculation together with my co-authors, it suggests that there is actually a full offset. Now, that depends on behavioral assumptions. There is uncertainty exactly how you value this. But that can explain why bank stocks actually have been holding up uh, reasonably well. Now, did banks just figure that out? Well, there's an easy way to see whether banks can get that right. And if you looked at SVB, you would see that they wouldn't get it right. Basically, what the bank has to do is that to make sure that the change on the asset side, as assets are rolling off and resetting to new interest rates, that that change is the same on the deposit side. So they're matching what we have, sort of an income beta on the asset side to so this deposit beta. And that means the net interest margin is going to stay stable as interest rate change. Banks. Um, have been doing this for a long time. So here I'm plotting the net interest margin for the banking system of all going back to the 50s. And when you see this red line, it's stable, eh? even though interest rates are moving up and down. So you know, we are worried about the rise of interest rates, uh, five percentage points. You know, if you put that in the context of history, this happens all the time. You, know, you go back to the Volca area, you know, raise the interest rates all the way up to 16 percentage points. And so Banks are used to this, and if they get it right, they are able to keep the net interest margin stable, and that means you know, the banking sector would actually be fine. Now, obviously, there are some risks. Um, this deposit hedge only works if most of the deposits stay with the bank. Are kind of two separate risks. So the first risk, which we saw materialize in March, is depositors may run on the bank, especially if they're uninsured. Well, if they run on the bank, that's going to destroy the deposit franchise. Uh, the hedge is going to fail. It's not going to be there anymore. And you know, basically, the bank is going to be bankrupt. That's one risk. The other risk is, well, depositors may wake up to the fact that they're actually paying a lot for these deposits. And so they might start seeking out higher paying alternatives, like money market funds or other um, you know, short-term assets which pay a competitive yield. So, if that happens, the deposit beta is going to go up, and it wouldn't be as good of a hedge. And that risk, it looks like it's larger for regional banks, because uh, they are seeing a lot of the outflows. A lot of the outflows actually go to the large banks. In some sense, the large banks actually might be better off. The betas actually might go down, because people are going there for safety. But of all the key risks going forward uh, is basically what's going to happen to this deposit franchise. Now, I don't have the answer, but I have two clues on what has been happening so far. So one thing you want to look at is what about deposit flows from small banks to large banks? So here I'm plotting the change in deposit growth in billion for large versus small banks. What you see is sort of this spike here in the week after you know, Silicon Valley Bank failed. There was definitely a run from the uh, small banks, so that's in blue, roughly 160 billion going to the large banks. Now, if that continues, that might be the end for the mid-sized banks. It looks like it stopped last week, presumably because of the measures the government has taken. So we'll see whether it's going to go forward. But at least for now, that situation has stabilized. Now, importantly, these deposits stay within the system. They're just sort of moving around. That's going to cause some trouble for the mid-sized lender, less for the large banks. What the large banks are worried about is the deposit leave the system of all and go, for example, to money market funds. So what happened with money market funds? Well, what's important to know is deposits have been flowing out to money market funds since the Fed started raising. So here I'm plotting uh, retail money market funds. So you can sort of see them here in blue. They've been going up by 35% since the Fed started raising. Um, here the deposit of the banking system, they have been going down by like roughly 5%. That's because money market funds are much smaller than the banking system. That's normal monetary policy. It's called the deposit channel of monetary policy. There's nothing unusual about that. That happens in every single cycle. And I have some work sort of going back in time documenting that. Now, the problem is for the banks, this accelerated after Silicon Valley Bank failed. So it went from something like 20 billion per week, which you want to think of as the benchmark, uh, to 116 billion. That's six times as large. Still not much in terms of total deposit, less than 1%. But if that continues week after week, that would be a big problem for the large banks. Now, it looks like last week it started to come down. Now it's 60 billion, still three times as large as before. If it continues to come down, the 
big banks presumably going to be fine in terms of the deposit franchise. If it stays that high or gets high again, you know, then even the large banks are going to be in trouble. They're going to have to reevaluate the value of the deposit franchise. The value is a hedge. Probably means the market actually is going to go down and potentially would see them lending less. I wouldn't be so worried about them going bankrupt, but there could potentially be less equity and you know, potentially uh, a credit crunch. OK, um, I will hand it over to Larry. Right. Well, thank you. That was an excellent masterclass in making sense of the plumbing of banks. I often think these institutions are a bit like some kind of Heath Robin-esque machine where you pull on one lever and something quite unexpected happens at the other end, which takes a while to kind of see the transition mechanism. But anyway, now Larry is going to tell us his perspective. Um, and he's had a fantastically interesting um, background to talk about this because you were actually at, not the FDIC as I thought, but the Federal Home Loan banking system during the savings and loans crisis. And so that is not just Groundhog Day, but Groundhog Groundhog Day, I think. Alas, that is so. Um, so pleased to be here, pleased that you're here, and uh, wish we weren't talking about this, uh, but here we are. Now, like any good business school professor, I've got to tell you what I'm going to say, and then I'm going to say it, and then I'll tell you what I say. Um, now, I'm, net, I'm not making this up. When I heard Jillian talk idiosyncratic, <laughs> the first thing I heard was idiot, okay? <laughs> and that's what I think about what was going on here. Um, the basic story is Silicon Valley Bank was borrowing short, lending long in the finance world. They call that the carry trade. Uh, it's what the SNLs were doing in the 1970s. Um, it's a good way to make a living as long as interest rates stay stable or go down. If they go up, as they did in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, and it's going to cause problems. That's what the SNLs learned. That's what Silicon Valley Bank learned. And uh, I can't not point out that gap accounting makes it harder. Not impossible. The data are there, but it's muffled. Uh, and I'm going to come back to that. Uh, other problems, over 90% of Silicon Valley Bank's uh, in deposits were uninsured, which meant they were highly runnable. Um, they had an undiversified lending base. They had an undiversified deposit base. And they had grown rapidly. Over the space of four years, their um, assets grew by a factor of two and a half. Uh, in uh, the space of two years, they grew. Uh, they more than doubled. And here we are at a business school. Our management folks could tell you rapid growth is going to create stresses and, str and strains in any organization. They had inadequate capital and liquidity for the risks. And as we're unpeeling the onion, we're learning inadequate monitoring and supervision by the Federal Reserve uh, Bank of San Francisco. Now, the word capital is going to be used over and over again today. Philip already mentioned it. Viral is going to be talking about it as well. And so I'm going to give you a quick primer. Um, I mentioned this to Jillian. Alas, even in the um, world of financial journalism, one sees NIS characterizations of capital, and it's often identified with cash or money, uh, or even identified somehow with liquidity. Uh, what it really is, is basically owner's equity or net worth. It's the arithmetic difference between the value of the assets and the value of the fixed liabilities, and how those as, uh, values are measured is really, really important. And let me just go ahead here. Simple balance sheet, OK? I've stylized everything so that the assets are 100. And what are those assets? They're primary loan, primarily loans of various kinds, or bonds, which are basically a loan. And what are the primary um, liabilities? They are deposits. And notice, as Philip said just a few minutes ago, those loans are longer term, those deposits are short term, and they are runnable. 
The difference between the two, it, again, measurement matters, but suppose that those values really are right, is the owner's net worth, or um, in the banking world, we call it capital. And that's what a solvent bank looks like. And just to point out, what does an insolvent bank look like? It looks like that. The value of the loans is no longer adequate to cover the obligations to the depositor uh, liability holders. This is an underwater, uh, this is an insolvent. In the outside of the financial world, we would call this bankrupt. Uh, that's the nature of the problem. All right, so why is capital important? At first, we're in a system of legal liability by the owners, so those liability holders can't go after the owners. They only have a claim on those assets on the books of, uh, on the book of the bank. It's a cushion, you know, again, think of what's going on here. It's a cushion against losses. If the assets go down in value, at least up till a loss of eight, there's still a positive net worth, there's a cushion. The bigger the capital level, the bigger the cushion. Uh, it's a deterrent to taking risk because the owner has more skin in the game, the bigger is the capital uh, value. Uh, lenders, and again, depositors are lenders to the bank, should always be worried about the adequacy of the borrowers, of the um, uh, bar yeah, right. The bank is borrowing from the depositor, the borrower's capital. And how do we measure this thing? I'm going to come back to this. It should be on a market value basis. All right. So are there other problems uh, lurking in the financial system? And the answer is yes. And you're going to see a bunch of charts. I have shamelessly borrowed these from Viral. You're going to be seeing some of the same um, um, uh, diagrams and charts um, in Viral's presentation. First, are there other banks with substantial unrecognized losses on their balance sheet? Yes, there they are. Uh, those are their stock market tickers. You could uh, readily um, look up and see where they are. By the way, this I'm happy to send this slide deck to anybody who uh, would like it, or I, I had my... Um, email on the cover slide, or you can just find me at Stern. Don't look for me at George Mason University. That's the other Larry White. I'm the Larry White at, uh, at Stern. I'll be happy to send you the slide and continue in this conversation. So there are other banks where there are substantial, not as bad as Silicon Valley Bank, but still other banks with that uh, in a sense, their balance sheet over, importantly, overstates their actual uh, capital. And in aggregate, just if we look at securities, um, the aggregate is uh, a shade at the end of 2022, a shade over $600 billion. As uh, Philip mentioned, the aggregate net worth capital in the banking world is about $2.2 trillion. So that's over a quarter. And as Philip pointed out, if you looked at the real value of their other uh, loans, which are, if they were marked to market in a similar way, we would be looking at not 600 billion, but 1.7 trillion dollars of um, you know, lost value. Not quite wiping out the banking net worth, but coming uh, too close. All right, what else? Other banks have high levels of uninsured deposits. Let me scroll through here. There are these banks, again, their stock market ticker and their percentages of uh, uninsured deposits. And you know, here are banks with 40 and 50% uninsured deposits. At least one thing in the savings and loan debacle, almost all of the deposits were insured. We didn't have runs problems. Here you can see the potential for runs problems by uninsured depositors and contagion when a one uh, when a set of depositors in 
another bank start getting nervous when they see depositors in a first bank starting to withdraw their money. Or, you know, I said, see, I still have these images of people lining up outside a bank of the 1930s or 1940s. Uh, nowadays, all they have to do is see some social media with uh, individuals uh, saying, hey, I'm not so sure about the credit worthiness of the XYZ bank, and suddenly you can have a run and then contagion. Okay, what else are we talking about? The overall banking system has reduced its capital to asset ratios since 2017 and here you can see those data. Again, Viral is going to show you the same slide. Things going downhill after 2017 and Remember, this is the reported net worth. It doesn't include those embedded, unrecognized losses. Things would be a whole lot serious, more serious if those were included. Um, contagion problems are real. Again, in a world of social media, you got to worry about contagion. Uh, and it's not just the big banks. In fact, there probably is less of a problem with big banks. It's those small and medium-sized banks. And then the cherry on top of everything else, commercial, um, commercial mortgages, uh, lending on commercial real estate. Historically, this has been a problem for commercial banks. It was true in the 1980s. It was true again around the period of the great financial crisis of 2008. What did in the commercial banks that failed? Uh, it was commercial real estate. Somehow these guys keep on making too many loans and not good enough loans to commercial real, uh, to commercial real estate borrowers. And we, as we know, it's hard to figure out what's going to be happening with commercial real estate, but it's probably not going to be a rising asset over the next few years. All right, so what needs to be done? Increase bank capital levels generally. More capital. Measure that capital better. Mark to market or market value accounting. The accountants would call it fair value. Let's get realistic values onto bank balance sheets rather than the pretend values that current gap accounting uh, provides. I'm a in favor of increasing deposit insurance levels, not because I'm all that sympathetic to people who have above $250,000 in a bank. I'm primarily worried about contagion, that if you have uninsured depositors, they can run. And again, in a social media world, they're more likely to run. We have contagion problems. It would expand the ability to release more what is now confidential information, the CAMELS rating, the ratings that the bank supervisors give to particular banks. And you will hear anytime somebody like me says expand deposit insurance, somebody will yell, yeah, but the moral hazard problem. The moral hazard problem, that's a red herring. Depositors, time and time again, have not been good monitors of banks. Instead, let's get better, in addition to the regulators, better monitors, uh, subordinated debt, or some other kind of non-runnable debt with knowledgeable holders who have some governance rights. Uh, it's longer term. It can't be run. That's the way we get better monitoring of banks. And of course, we need to improve. I mean, just everything that's coming out about the Federal uh, Home Loan, uh, Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, uh, they weren't doing their job. Uh, we need better paid, better staffed, better trained, better managed. And so my conclusion, how can one not quote Rahm Emanuel uh, on, on this? Don't let a crisis go to waste. Thank you. Uh, and again, I'm happy to carry on this. Uh, you know how to reach me. Happy to continue. For all. Well, thank you, Larry. That was really helpful. I must say, I love your comment about even financial journalists don't understand bank capital. Um, I take that as a rather flattering um, backhanded compliment. Um, I'd say many financial Julian, journalists. I'm sure don't. you understand bank capital. Yeah.
I mean, and while Riyadh's coming up, there are lots of questions there. I mean, one of the questions I'm dying to ask you in a moment is whether you think, rather than lambasting the Fed, that's clearly been asleep at the wheel, shouldn't we just hand the whole thing to the OCC, who at least have the merits of looking at the world from a bottom-up perspective and having tracked interest rate risk rather well for many years? But anyway, think about that one. Okay. Doral, over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for being here. Uh, so, uh, I think Philip and Larry have made a couple of really excellent points. One is that the real issue seems to be about the large stock of uninsured deposits that's sitting around in the banking system uh, and that uninsured depositors run. Uh, they might be lousy monitors, but once they hear that there is a problem, they definitely vote with their feet and switch either to money market funds or to better banks, as Philip pointed out. Uh, and I think you can see this issue in data. If you look at the several monetary tightening cycles, uh, in each cycle on the x-axis, you're looking at how many months we are out. As Philip pointed out, uh, banks do lose money during uh, the rate hikes to money market funds because they are a bit slow uh, in raising rates for uh, saving their franchise. Uh, but this time, there's something else going on in the red line, which is that uh, the pace of losses to money market funds is anyway a bit fast. Uh, perhaps that can be explained by the pace of the rate hikes in the first place. But then you see around month 11 that there is a very, very further steep increase, and that has something to do with the fact that now un uninsured depositors are not just flocking because of just some interest rate considerations, they are actually leaving the banks. They are voting with their feet on banks that they are not very comfortable about. So the question is, do we need to think a little bit about how did this talk of uninsured deposits came about in the first place? And I think it's important to, uh, to think about that a bit right. And uh, my, my sense, based on my prior research, is that this has something to do with the scale of unprecedented monetary and perhaps to some extent fiscal expansion that we had after the pandemic. Uh, so I'm going to do a couple of things. I want to first explain to you why quantitative easing, which is an expansion of the central bank balance sheet, typically also lead to an expansion of bank balance sheets. Okay, this is a, a somewhat underappreciated fact, which is that we keep saying Fed is expanding its balance sheet. Fed's balance sheet is now $8 trillion, et cetera. But we don't recognize that when that expansion happens, commercial bank balance sheets are expanding as well. And I want to explain why that happens. And importantly, I want to clarify that this expansion of commercial bank balance sheets happens indeed with uninsured deposits, okay? which is that it's this combination of expansion of commercial banks and expansion with uninsured deposits, which is a feature of quantitative easing, uh, as I'll show you. Uh, in fact, my co-author Raghuram Rajan uh, and others, but Raghu presented this in Washington, D.C., where Megan Green of the FT actually uh, wrote about it, saying that this is going to become like a Hotel California problem for for the Fed, because if you expand by creating uninsured deposits in banks, you know, some concern about banks, runs will materialize. Now the Fed has to start injecting liquidity all over again, and you just can't get out. You are now trapped in this uh, large balance sheet size. Uh, and, and the key point is that this, we, we did have cycles of quantitative easing and tightening over the last decade. So why, why is this time special? This time is special because it's magnified. Okay, it's all about the scale of the pandemic stimulus that makes this a really serious problem uh, in our view. So let me walk through this uh, uh, in the spirit of being a bit textbookish, uh, just to lay this simple principle correct. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have the Fed balance sheet, the banking sector balance sheet, and the public balance sheet. Think of public as non-banks, family offices, startups, corporate treasurers, whatever you want. Okay? Now, what happens in quantitative easing is that the Fed buys uh, <coughs> treasury securities from someone, so it adds to its balance sheet, it expands its balance sheet. And against that, it creates a reserve liability, which is that it credits the account of some commercial bank with a reserve when this happens. Now, where does this treasury security typically come from? In our work that I presented at the Jackson Hole in August, we showed that typically 
the expansion of the Fed balance sheet happens by taking securities from non-banks. So let's say a pension fund or a family office or a corporate treasurer turns over their treasuries to the Fed. So what happens to them? They lose a security out of their balance sheet. And when they sell it, their commercial bank credits them with a deposit. Okay? So what happened to the commercial bank in the process? They expanded their deposit by a dollar in this case. And on the left-hand side, they got a reserve from the central bank. So what we generally think of quantitative easing as, which is on the top, an expansion of the Fed balance sheet, is actually an expansion of the commercial bank balance sheet. And typically, because this expansion happens with large parts of the non-bank system, these deposits that banks are left with are uninsured deposits. Okay? And these, I, I think both of these points are somewhat underappreciated. Mm -hmm. Now, how did this play out uh, this time around when quantitative easing was done? You can see here that the stock of uninsured deposits in banks is essentially growing at anything at the rate of about, uh, here you see it's in trillions, so it's growing at about $300 billion uh, per, uh, per, uh, per, per quarter, uh, uh, sort of very, very large amount. And why is that very large? Because it quickly adds up to two and a half, uh, $3 trillion over the several quarters that we have seen. The banking system overall grows from a very large size by two and a half to $3 trillion. If you look at it in percentages of uninsured to total deposits, you have that ratio going up from 48% to about 52%. It doesn't seem very large, but 4% of total stock of deposits is very, very large. Okay? It's, 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 a very, it's a very large amount. Okay, now, uh, is, is this something new? Uh, what we showed is that that isn't the case. Actually, every time Fed has done QE, this is 2009, this is 2011, this is 2013, every time Fed has done QE, this blue line, which is the stock of uninsured deposits in the banking system, rises. Okay, so we have seen this in the past. We know that when Fed expands its balance sheet, it's the stock of uninsured deposits in the banking system that rises. You can see at the time of pandemic QE, this happened very fast as well. The one difference is that at time of pandemic QE, even the insured deposits rise a lot, and that's because there was also the fiscal stimulus that was done by the government. Now, why does all this matter? This matters because it affects the scale of things. Okay? It tells us why the problems are magnified this time. So let's look at this quantitative easing and then the quantitative tightening cycle. You can see that uh, banks' unrealized losses, uh, unrealized gains rose. Then during quantitative tightening and Fed rate hikes in 1718, banks again made losses. But these problems were small. These were less than $50 billion of losses on the entire banking system as a whole. What you have this time is $75 billion going to $750 billion or $60 billion going to $675 billion. And we think there are two factors that explain this. One, the interest rate, pace of interest rate hikes and the scale of hikes is three times magnified. But the bank balance sheets are three times uh, larger in, in, a, in a rough sense, okay, which is that it's, it's not exact, but that's, that's roughly one way to think about it, which is that the scale of the problem is three times larger because of bank balance sheet expansion, and the scale of the problem is three times larger because of interest rate hikes, and then you get this tenfold uh, magnitude uh, increase. Okay, so why is this a problem? The problem is because we have simultaneously relaxed capital standards, as Larry was explaining, which is, okay, so we have stock banks with uninsured deposits through QE. They are doing maturity transformation, as Philip explained, but because it's being done on the back of uninsured deposits, behavior can change, as we have seen very quickly. Losses materialize, and then if capital is not where it used to be, it very quickly creates doubts of, solvency in the minds uh, of depositors. My sense of depositors is a little bit like a person waiting at the airport. Uh, until you reach your gate and the flashing sign says the flight is on time, you don't entertain the possibility that flight is going to be late. But the moment they say it's five minutes late, 10 minutes late, you start calling United Global Services and, or uh, frequent flyer accounts and tell them, oh, this flight is late. Is it going to be one hour late, two hours late? You start looking for different options, and they start running. Okay? So uh, I don't know how to fix airlines, but 
I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what we could do about the banking system. Uh, maybe we should just fix airlines uh, instead. It might be easier. OK, so what should be done with banks now? So one option on the table, which is always an uh, option, is to backstop everything. And maybe if you're the United States government, uh, one sort of feels comfortable doing this in large quantities uh, until maybe uh, the day of reckoning comes at some point, which perhaps hasn't yet uh, occurred. But uh, my view is that we can't approach things in this way, partly because if you do that, you just socialize all risk taking in the private financial system, and you've got to get them to internalize some of the risks of maturity transformation uh, that materialize every now and then. So uh, my, my recommendation is that we should look back to the toolkit of 2009 to get some guidance on how we might want to proceed. We can't copy it exactly, but maybe that can give us some pointers. Okay? Uh, I won't dwell on this, but I want to make two points. One, that in 2008 fall after Lehman Brothers collapsed, we did backstop everything. Okay, we backstopped creditors, bondholders, we backstopped uninsured uh, depositors, we, back, we backstopped corporate deposits, we backstopped insured deposits by raising the amount. We had backstopped everything. And yet implied volatility on banks was high until May of 2009. Bank credit default swap spreads were high until 2009. And that's because there was a general loss of trust. Uh, and confidence in the banking system at that point. So you, in, times, in times like this, and I'm not saying we are at a Lehman Brothers point or, or even a Bear Stearns point, but regulators should prepare themselves to, be, to do things right if things actually get worse uh, in the coming weeks or months. Uh, I don't like to look through the oracle and see whether that's going to happen or not. I think it's better to be prepared uh, for a bad outcome rather than saying it's going to happen or it's not going to happen. So in my view, what needs to be done is that Fed should prepare itself for doing a stress test and raise capital in the banking system, but they need to change their stress scenario a little bit. As our colleague Thomas Philippon uh, very sharply observed, that the current stress test didn't pick up these problems because when a recession happens in the Fed stress test, interest rates are cut down. So the stress test did not actually factor in an interest rate hike. And so therefore, the Fed needs to actually factor in a stagflation in some sense, which is a recession, but in times of high interest rates. Uh, as Larry explained, to do this well, you have to do an honest asset quality review. You have to mark to market. You have to recognize declines in commercial real estate loan values. Uh, you'd have to recognize that many securities will lose value if interest rates are high. Uh, as Philip explained, the problem right now is not that large. So maybe this is not a bad time to ask banks to raise capital. They actually have market equity of capital in their balance sheets, uh, and they can surely raise some in the market. Uh, and let me explain what happens when the system as a whole raises bank capital. Someone has to buy that equity. Okay? So you and I will actually take out of our deposit, and if the bank equity is at an attractive price, we will actually buy equity. So when you get the banking system to raise capital in the aggregate, you are actually shifting deposits from the banking system into a capital claim on the banking system. Okay? And that's an overall stabilization of the capital structure uh, of the economy. But last point, I agree with Philip that many deposits of banks will end up being stable. Some concession could be considered while marking assets to market. Perhaps some average duration of deposits could be considered. But I, being a stress test, I would not extend that beyond the insured deposits of the banks. I would assume everything else has to be made uh, payable uh, immediately. So uh, in short, uh, banks generally get run slow at first, then fast. Maybe that's just Hemingway's way of describing bankruptcy, but just for banks. Uh, so what's a robust response? In my view, we can't just rely on socializing the risks all the time. We should have private deposit insurance. Bank capital is a form of that. We should mark it honestly. We should stress it plausibly. Uh, and then raise its levels credibly uh, in the system. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Varel. That's really, really fascinating. And we had a flicker of disagreement between you and Larry about how far deposits should or should not be um, insured, which is interesting. Um, but um, I think we now have questions. Before we start, I'd like to ask just two quick questions. One is I'd love to ask Larry about 
the whether you think the answer is just to give everything to the OCC because America has a really nasty, you know, fractured picture of regulation. A lot of what happened um, at, in the last, you know, month was a function of regulatory arbitrage in different states and federal levels having different regulators. But I'm curious, you know, the OCC in my dealings with them have always been um, much more tuned, it seems, to interest rate risks than groups like the Fed, who, as Varel just said, um, really dropped the ball on the interest rate is issue. I mean, there's a fascinating paper by Patrick Honahan, the former um, central bank governor of Ireland, pointing out, you know, how astonishing it is that in an era of rising rates, the Fed wasn't changing its stress tests or even looking at proper interest rate rises at all. I mean, absolutely shocking. So I'd love to know whether you think the OCC does a better job um, and they should be the answer. Um, and I'm also curious for all of you about what you think the impact of social media and virality has been on this. Because, um, you know, does this change things significantly? Is it just an acceleration of the issues? Um, is there any way to stop social media being an issue? Because the Fed's doing a lot of thinking about this. And, you know, can you gate deposit accounts online in a crisis? Should you be prosecuting people for spreading panic-stricken messages? Um, you know, should the Fed window be open for more than a few hours a day to cope with this? Because one of the big issues with Silicon Valley Bank was that it desperately tried on the Thursday night to get the Fed to give it more cash to meet deposited claims in exchange for its collateral, which it had oodles of collateral to, to, to offer. Um, but the Fed window was only open, I gather, until four or five o'clock New York time, which meant it had you know, already closed by Thursday night, um, and that was too late. So you have 20, Fed using 20th century technology um, in a 21st century mobile banking world. So anyway, those are my questions, and then we'll chuck it open. All right, very quickly, the, the American banking regulatory system, uh, Julian, as you said, is fragmented. On the one hand, that's can be a good thing because then there are multiple places where good ideas can flourish. On the other hand, it also means there are multiple places where things can go wrong. And here this was an, a case. The uh, OCC has had a reputation of being a better regulator, that's right, on interest rate risk. They absorbed the regulators of the savings and loan. Uh, industry through absorbing the Office of Thrift Supervision. So they had some embedded human capital that had thought about uh, um, interest rate uh, risk. But, uh, you know, I'm maybe put more, but I'm not sure I would want a single regulator because then if things go wrong, it's really a problem. That's one of the advantages of having uh, a diversified system. You're not putting all the eggs in one basket. As far as the social media issues, I don't think we can gate stuff. Um, uh, Professor Jeffrey Gordon at the Columbia Law School has an interesting idea that would say basically uninsured deposits ought by contract be less runnable uh, and there would be some gates automatically. You can't impose gates um, you know, suddenly, that's changing the terms of the contract, but if you beforehand say, look, here's what an uninsured deposit looks like. You've got to have at least a seven-day window. And if you, this is all Jeffrey Gordon's idea, if you start withdrawing, you're going to pay a penalty. And all, also, by the way, you get some bank equity uh, along with the deposit. It changes the terms of the arrangement. I'm not sure it's a complete idea, but it's time to be, think as Jeffrey says, um, financial innovation. Let's be thinking creatively about if we're going to have uninsured deposits, how to do that. That's fascinating. Um, either of you got a view on this in terms of how you deal with, you know, cyber flash mobs? Um. You know, the way I think about it is, you know, a bank is in the business of managing liquidity risk, credit risk, and interest rate risk. And Silicon Valley Bank clearly did not follow the prescription I put up. And you could see that, you know, uh, that the NIM was turning down. They went very long in terms of their asset duration. So, you know, as we now know, they were mismatched. They also had all these uninsured deposits, so they didn't do a good job, you know, dealing with the liquidity risk. By the time 
you get to the run, the game is almost over. So, you know, I, you know, sure social media may have accelerated it on the margin, but in some sense, I think what happened is we got a front row seat out. A bank run usually works. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, in the old days, we would line up in front of the branch. Maybe, you know, in some other times, you know, people just call each other. Here, everybody could see it on Twitter happening. Uh, but I'm not sure it's the culprit. So on the same margin, the Fed should have stayed open uh, and lent against this MBS. It's a little unusual that they closed so early. Would that have changed much? We don't know. Uh, I think it's unlikely that it would have saved Silicon Valley Bank, but maybe they wouldn't have had to intervene in the middle of the day. So, um, you know, I think at that point, once we got there, uh, the game was effectively already over for Silicon Valley Bank. Right. Okay. Burrell, any comments? Uh, yeah, I think I'm, I'm sort of with Philip a little bit that at the end, the social media maybe is just an amplifier on the pace of things rather than being the source of the problem. Uh, I think one thing I, I would stress, though, is that uh, in some sense what we are seeing, to me the issue with the Fed seems more that uh, it's doing sort of very big interventions. Uh, you know, we went from, you know, quantity of reserves in the market being a few, a few scores of billions to then a trillion, then four trillion, then eight trillion. Uh, and I think I'm just going to use a very common sense principle, which is that when you intervene on this scale, there's bound to be unintended consequences and there's bound to be mistakes. And it seems we are we are just not thinking very hard about these issues. Uh, you know, the policy is filtering into now uninsured deposits, health of the banking system, credit and uh, interest rate and liquidity problems are getting intermingled because economy is slowing down, rates are rising, uh, and you have this uh, run problem. So the three risks that Philip mentioned are becoming sort of all commingled on some balance sheets as we speak. Uh, and it requires, in my view, a little bit of a pause uh, that we really have to think hard about this toolkit that we seem to have embraced after the global financial crisis to do more and more, do whatever it takes, and then uh, and then deal with it ex post. I thought we had sort of accepted that that Greenspan, Alan Greenspan approach of mopping up afterwards wasn't the right way to go. Uh, and as you pointed out, we did restore bank capital, but then we brought it down again because maybe we were far enough away from the past crisis. So uh, to me, it, it seems to me social media is a, is a fact of life, not my life, but for most other people's lives. Uh, but uh, maybe maybe the, the bigger issue is why are these things happening on this scale? I think that seems to me to be the real uh, mm. problem at hand. Right. Um, questions? I think we're going on to 10 o'clock, are we? Is that right? Uh, yeah. yeah. All right. We can go maybe five minutes. Or okay, three, right. Minutes. Anyone got any questions they want to ask this amazing trio? Yep, one over there. Yeah. Is this crisis over? If we knew, we would first place our bets in the stock market and then tell you. Uh, and, you know, I'm an optimist. I hope that it is over. But, you know, all you've got to do is look at those banks with over 50 percent uh, uninsured deposits, the banks with the unrecognized, the gap, uh, unrecognized losses. Um, the fact that there are now about three or four hundred banks that are on the FDIC problem list. Um, curiously, Silicon Valley Bank appears not to have been on their problem list uh, as of the third quarter. What was going on there? Um, so nobody really knows, but I, you know, though I'm an optimist, I'm worried about contagion. And that's what makes this issue, this potential crisis different from 2008, which is at that time it was all about the big guys. Here, Silicon Valley Bank, yes, it was $200 billion of assets, much bigger than anybody here can really imagine, but still uh, it was the 16th largest bank in the United States, not one of the big three or four. But with contagion, 
which I think is really why the, FDI, the FDIC, the Fed, and the Treasury stepped in on that Sunday immediately after Silicon Valley Bank was closed and said, hey, we've got to insure all the deposits, even though we're not supposed to, because we're worried about contagion. That's the real worry, even among small and medium-sized banks. That's the worry. Right, right. But I should say, by the way, the reason I'm tapping my phone is actually taking notes. I'm not sort of emailing all my friends or anything. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I think the short answer is we don't know. Uh, the long answer, I would say, is the following. So there's something very different from 2008 to now. In 2008, there was credit risk, and we didn't understand it. It was on all of the bank's balance sheet. Uh, Banks didn't know what was the credit risk of other banks, so there was a lot of asymmetric information. They weren't lending to each other. And we had to do a very diligent asset quality review. We had stress tests to figure out what is actually going on with bank assets. That was about credit risk. This time it's about interest rate risk. And I was making the point, interest rate risk is very easy to assess. I don't know whether my number is exactly right, but I'm pretty sure the order of magnitude is right. I don't even have to go into the bank. All I need to know is the asset duration. So the asset side is really simple. What the uncertainty is this time around is on the deposit side. We don't know whether there are going to be more runs. It looks like that stopped, but you know we'll see. So that's the issue of contagion. I think the bigger issue may be like how deposits are going to respond to dissolve all terminal. We often call them sleepy. That's why they sort of accept these low deposit rates. Do they going to go back to that world? Well, then we are probably back to where we were before. Or is to some sense that you know, we're going to see more outflows? So the way I would evaluate it is exactly these two metrics I put up. Within the banking sector, do we see a migration from the mid-sized lenders to the large lenders? That's not a problem for the system, but it's a problem for the mid-sized lenders and it's a problem for their borrowers. Now, if deposits go to JP Morgan, JP Morgan can lend to the borrowers of the mid-sized lenders, but that's going to take some rearrangement. There are certain sectors like commercial real estate, which heavily depend on the smaller banks, so there could be some trouble there. The other issue is, does the money leave the system of all, going to go to money market funds? It comes back in the form of wholesale deposits, but these are very different type of deposits, which would also cause trouble for the large banks. At that point, you know, the large banks may also pull back on their lending, and I think you could potentially see a bigger credit crunch. But I think those two metrics you want to keep an eye on, they will tell you how big the problem is going to be going forward. I must say I find this fascinating as someone who trained as a cultural anthropologist because another way of encapsulating what you're saying is it really comes down to behavioral finance right now, and you can't really project in a model how your average consumer armed, armed with a smartphone is going to behave that simply. Sorry, you're going to disagree yeah, yeah, with me? I, I just want to respond to that. It seems you know, a little surprising that we you know, have to rely on all these behavioral assumptions. Now, we're kind of used to that. When we model mortgage-backed securities, you know, we have to deal with prepayment risk. It's all based on you know, what, you know, you know, how people make these choices and typically don't make them optimally. It's the same here. The banks have a lot of like, experience doing that. Uh, to the issue of market-to-market -market accounting, they don't disclose a lot about how exactly they do that. Uh, and I think I would like to know more about it. But it really comes down to trying to understand deposit behavior. That's crucial for valuing the franchise. There's no way around it. And I'd just like to say, again, as an anthropologist, you know, in, during the 2008 crisis, it became clear that one reason the models have blown up on mortgage-backed securities was because in the early noughties, behavior shifted around mortgages in that people assumed that in the old days, you defaulted first on your credit card, then your auto loan, then your mortgage. And that shifted for cultural reasons in the noughties. And economists who are looking at things top down, bird's eye view, didn't see that kind of worm's eye shift happening or you know, grassroots shift happening. And so their models blew up. And I'm just really curious right now about how the rise of mobile banking, two thirds of US households now have mobile bank accounts so that's you know, more than double what it was eight years ago. How the shift towards mobile banking and you know, the virality of social media might be changing consumer behavior at a time when consumers matter so deeply, or consumer behavior matters so deeply with deposits. Anyway, sorry, Burrell, I think Burrell, you say something? Or yeah, no, we'll go I, to I, I think I, so my sense is, uh, I think the only qualification I would have to what Philip said is, uh, I think there is more to the economy going on than just interest rate hikes. Uh, you know, Silicon Valley Bank was exposed to the tech sector, which we know is having layoffs and slowdown 
it was overstimulated and it's slowing down. Uh, you know, Silvergate and Signature Bank were also heavily exposed to crypto underlying assets. That's another asset class that was on a bubble that has corrected. Uh, First Republic Bank, which was sort of like the third or the fourth in the sequence, has sort of com real estate exposures in New York, in tech, co some commercial real estate. So uh, I think Larry stressed quite a bit, actually, that commercial real estate is probably undergoing a little bit of stress all over the country. So my view is that I think it's, it's a little bit more than just interest rate risk. I think there is actually risk in the economy right now. There are credit losses that could possibly arise. Uh, in fact, some of the deposit withdrawals out of Silicon Valley Bank were startups who weren't getting any further loans or who weren't, uh, who were drawing down because they wanted to make investments because their funding cycle had dried up with the rise in interest rates. And so uh, I think there's a combination of real economy slowdown and uh, interest rate hikes, in my view. And so I would prefer anything one does to a stagflation risk rather than just a pure interest rate hike risk. I think, I think the risks are intermingled, in my view, right now. Um, we've got a couple more, quite a few more questions. I mean, how long can we go on for? We got another five, uh, ten minutes. I mean, yeah, I think we are flexible. I think because uh, I think we haven't. Right. I haven't seen anybody yeah. leave yeah. yet, Julian. Right. Okay. So we had a question over. I think it must be over. We'll yeah. try and keep our answers. In fact, let's take let's take the questions one after the other, and then ask people to comment, and then we'll wrap. How does that sound? So, your question, your question, and then your question. <coughs> First, uh, thanks for very interesting uh, lectures. Um, my question was actually with respect to the, to the uh, correlation with the economy. I mean, I thought that should be like a significant part of the, of the analysis, um, knowing that the economy like, grew from like 16 trillion in 2008 to um, like in 25, about 25 percent, and at the same time, corporate loans in the U.S. grew up more than 100 percent. They, they doubled the amount uh, uh, that they were in 2008. So that shows apparently like a bubble of, uh, of credit, uh, which is much broader than the, the specific issue that you discussed. Great question. I agree. It was nuts. Um, question over there. Question over there. And by the way, do any women want to ask questions? <laughs> As a, having a daughter at college in, who's doing finance and economics, ah. she tells me that you know she's often the only one who puts her hand up. So, any women want, any women want to wave your hands? Uh, we've talked about the risk of deposits. You briefly mentioned the concern about commercial real estate, where values of underlying assets is declining, and that's not changing unless rates come back down to near zero. So, how do we quantify that impact? Because it's, it seems like it's just a matter of time before. Another great question, very well linked. Yep. And then the woman in front of you, who gets the prize for <laughs> putting your hand up. Yeah, go on. Okay. okay. So, um, with the large uh, uninsured depositors and these interest rate risks go to the CPG management price. So, I wonder if we dealt modern times, if you're moving from those principles, there wouldn't be a role for having this liquidity management for these companies who just want to do that, be held up out of that pretty much like digital money, they're just directly banking for these just large initial deposits having been put out of so stop messing around with the banking idiots, as Larry says, and instead just go straight to the central bank, maybe with the C B D C. Yeah. Yeah. And so we talked a lot about the risks and all the banks can do to and that's a great question because the large bank, the bank CEO I spoke to on the way here in the taxi, um, when I asked him, do you want um, uninsured depositors to be protected across the system? He said, heck no, because we're getting loads more deposits. So. Maybe, if, is there another question? Yeah, I think as yeah, Maybe so, I'll just, just, just two first two questions. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I, I didn't use the word bubble and overheating, but uh, in a way, one other way of thinking about the magnification of the problem is really that 
we had in my in my view a extremely large stimulus to the economy perhaps much larger than was required it's also manifested in the high levels of inflation which then combined with the with you know commodity prices and supply chain problems and so on so i'm with both of you that there is probably a likely landing for some sectors of the economy and i was alluding to some sectors which are already having it i think we have to stress those sectors in a stress test in my view to recognize if banks can withstand the losses and where they can't what to do about them uh, i'm not i'm not convinced that we need to do everything through the central bank uh, you know small businesses get credit lines they get business cards there are limits to this business cards uh, and uh, you know they uh, they have conditions attached to them so just the way i don't get a credit limit of any size i want and if my credit quality is better i want to have a larger credit limit than someone else i think what the central banks can do at best is give everyone an account up to a small amount and then they can use it as a digital wallet i think that'll be great for financial inclusion but i don't see how the central bank can decide whether a small business or a new startup in california what what size of a credit line to give it i think that's just impossible i think i think you you need a market economy you need banks and institutions i think no but i think liquidity uh, means i i think i would i'll hand it over to others but i think liquidity management is is in part a business practice i think i, I don't i think a small business is liquidity management is far more complex than my liquidity management so that's also a risk that they take and if they do it well they benefit from it if they don't do it well i think there have to be some consequences uh, in the end uh, what was your question can you just repeat it because it was the fourth question so i have yeah so i i think my sense is the opportunity is in rearranging the right hand side of your balance sheet going to the market earlier than others possibly to raise capital no bank wants to do it on their own because if you go the if you are the first one it looks like the kiss of death you reveal that perhaps you have problems and that is where i think a regulatory stress test comes it marks the books and then says you need x amount of capital you need y amount of capital you need z now when any bank goes to the market there's no further adverse information released beyond what the regulators have already disclosed my sense is the opportunity is to stabilize yourself before things get worse and worst case you raise more equity in one year if nothing has gone bad return it to your shareholders you know it'll be very easy to do you know the cliche the best time to fix the roof is when the sun is shining you don't wait till the thunderstorm and it's raining heavily to fix the roof raise capital in good times not when you're under severe stress so raising capital uh has to be a really important part of the story liquidity there are already um liquidity requirements that bank regulators impose and again why wasn't the federal reserve bank of san francisco all over silicon valley bank saying you've got an over 90% of your depositors who are uninsured and oh by the way these are pretty knowledgeable folks if things start to get a little dicey they could run on you you need to think about this they should have lined up a line with the fed in washington so that they weren't making telephone calls at 3 in the afternoon on thursday march 9 that was nuts philip okay very brief Last word. so uh stagflation so i spent the last 3 years of my life thinking about what happened in the 60s and 70s the last time where we had significant stagflation so if you're interested um i've done quite a bit of work on that the short answer is the financial system did actually pretty well during that time so that's not to say it's going to be the same but in some sense the troubles we have seen in march i would not pin on you know the potential for stagflation although you know it would affect the banking system but i'm happy to have a longer discussion about that you know uh, afterwards if you're interested um but there's quite a bit of work on that um commercial real estate you know um that potentially going to be 
a big issue. I'm not an expert on commercial real estate, but it definitely going to affect the mid-sized lenders uh, more um, on the smaller banks. Um, they already have been beaten down by the fact that it's hard for them to compete in a world where you have to invest billions into the app, and the large banks are pretty good at that. They can you know, basically marshal those resources, but it's hard for the mid-sized lenders. They have been under pressure before that. To your question, what's the opportunity? Well, for the mid-sized lenders, they have to try to differentiate themselves uh, desperately, because what are the large banks going to do in the times like this? Well, you know, if they buy a failed bank, the deposit's going to come to them. If they don't buy the failed bank, the deposit's going to come to them. I'm not surprised that large banks are sitting back and are happy about seeing these inflows because people go there for safety. They don't go for the interest rate. So that means their deposit betas, the ones that we're talking about, could actually be going down uh, because they actually have more market power. So for the large banks, you can definitely see there's an opportunity. I think for the mid-sized lenders, you know, it's not obvious that their business model is going to survive over the next um, decade or so. And the last one, liquidity management. Um, you know, I think the issue there is the financial system is pretty good in dealing with the uninsured deposits, which are wholesale funding. So that's, those are the large time deposits. I think they can do that. Where I think everybody had a blind spot was sort of more about this cor corporate checking accounts. So they're low beta, but they're also very flighty, as we learned. Uh, I don't think a lot of people were thinking about that. We'll need to think hard about that. It could be we're extending deposit insurance. We had that actually up to 2012. You know, after financial crisis for uh, you know, a limited amount of time, we had deposit insurance for transaction accounts for businesses. As long as they're non-interest bearing, we might bring that back. I think that's Larry's proposal. Uh, or maybe some sort of gates, uh, but you know, we want to recognize that they are flight. I think that's sort of where the issue is. That's on the order, according to the flow of funds, of $1 trillion out of $17 trillion. It's not that large. Uh, I don't think we necessarily need it for the others. Um, so I think that's a problem which can be dealt with directly. Great. Viral, last, last word, yeah, quickly. So in terms of the opportunities, because we are at a business school, so uh, I, I think as Philip said, when, if, if the mid-sized lenders start pulling back on credit, uh, I think several, I would say, sub-investment grade category borrowers will probably get left out. Large banks typically don't lend to them as much. Uh, and there's a lot of private debt market that's growing now where uh, not just CLOs like collateralized loan obligations, but also loan mutual funds, etc., are now beginning to directly lend to these players. Uh, I think there will be a tremendous opportunity if the banking stress gets worse and there's a credit crunch for the private markets to actually substitute where banks are pulling back on credit. So there could be opportunities outside of banks, in my view, uh, in lending to borrowers who get uh, crowded out uh, if, if the banking stress were to get worse. Well, therein lies the energy of entrepreneurial American capitalism. You know, one person's crisis is another person's opportunity. So there we go. Well, listen, thank you very much indeed. I learned an awful lot there, even as a financial journalist. So thank you very much indeed. And very best of luck to all of you in absorbing those incredibly important lessons um, and putting it into your own careers, studies, wherever you're going next. So thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you.